Okay, on to the next group. We are looking at several orders today from Psychoptera to Hemiptera. So let's start with the Psychoptera. The Psychoptera are the wood lice. Uh, they can also be called the bark lice, the book lice, that sort of thing. So when I first uh, learned them, I focused on that book lice thing. I'm a super big book reader. And it is uh, because of the way that they are formed or their, their major uh, development. So if you look at their uh, clypus right here, that very first, that, that, that thing that the uh, upper lip is attached to makes them look like they have a ginormous head, right? So they have this expanded clypus. So ginormous head made me think, oh, book lice. So psychoptera, book lice. So in this case, uh, psychos means rubbed or gnawed, and terra means wings. But I always thought they got a big head, they, they're book lice. So there we go. But also wood lice and bark lice and whatever. Now, these are abundant worldwide, but they are often overlooked. And this is the most primitive type of louse. The reason we call them the primitive types of louse is because they show little or no modification from the very basal mandibulate condition. So they have basic mandibles with maybe just a bigger upper lip. I mean, that's not much uh, different. So they live in moist terrestrial environments, uh, things like leaf litter, under stone, in uh, damp uh soil, you know, those sorts of places. Um, and this expanded clypus means that they have that large prominent head. Now, the reason that uh, they're often overlooked is because they rarely come into contact with animals or humans. They don't really cause uh, economic damage. They're, they're not that big a deal, really. And if you think about it, the ones that we really care about are pretty. They cause problems. They can help us. You know, that sort of thing. The psychopter are just sort of out there. They're decomposers. They feed on wood. Um, they, they might be upsetting if they get in and they feed on our books. So, you know, librarians and book lovers can have a problem with them. But that's pretty much it. What is interesting about the psychopter they is they have excellent powers of dispersal. So look at those really large wings right there. So usually they are among the first insects to colonize new islands or to invade disturbed habitats. So areas where all the insects have gotten killed off, say like in a forest fire or a natural disaster, you'll see psychoptera be among the first groups coming back. If there's a new... A uh, landmass that comes out or you know, a new island that pokes its head above the ocean or somewhere like that because of changes in the environment, psychopter tend to be the first ones right there. So that's sort of interesting about them. They can get there first and colonize areas first. Now, something a little bit more advanced are the theraptera. These are the lice. So you are going to see different names for theraptera. This might be a little different in your book. But these are very closely related to Psychoptera. But notice that name. Um, that name, that Theraptera, when there's an A in front of this Terra for the wings, it means they do not have wings. So this is one of these groups that doesn't have wings. Okay, so this group, this order, is divided into two suborders. Um, and I want you to know this for this class. We've got uh, the Anaplura the sucking lice, and the malophaga, so the chewing lice. Now, the, the phrase malophaga, this is being debated uh, on whether or not we should break it up. So some people break it up into several different types of chewing lice, depending on what they feed on. Some people don't. Uh, for the purposes of this class, we are just going to know the anaplura and the malophaga. So suborders for you there. Okay, so the distinction between Anaplura and Malophaga is the presence or absence of chewing mandibles. So both of these groups, all of the lice, are ectoparasites. They feed on living organisms on the outside of their body. Now, the uh, Anaplura, they have piercing and sucking mouth parts. So they've got these cone-like mouth parts, and they will feed on blood. So they, these cone-like mouth parts mean that their head is much smaller than their thoracic region. 
And their tarsi are highly specialized. So if you look here, they've got the uh, tibia and the tarsus. So the tibia is this little bit right there, and the tarsi makes that claw. So the tibia is also bifurcated. So those, that tibia and tarsus there, they will grasp on to hairs. And depending on the animal species that these are on, depending on the area of the body on humans, those uh, claws, that grasping area, that is going to have different diameters. So the thicker the hair of its preferred host, the larger those claws are going to be. Now notice I said the, the phrase preferred host. What I mean by this is there are certain ectoparasites that will feed on certain animals. So if you think about this, a parasite, something that is feeding on a living organism, it has to be pretty specialized. It has to have the right mouth parts to feed on the organism. It has to have the right uh, chemicals to, say, keep blood flowing, to keep the immune system from fighting off the body, uh, the body's um, invaders, that sort of thing. So it has to keep all of this together. And that takes millions of years of evolution. It takes time to get this all figured out. Okay, so... A preferred host is a host where this ectoparasite or this endoparasite or whatever has evolved with that host for millions of years. So it's got a good rapport with this host. Uh, we know it's a preferred host because this is the host that the ectoparasite or the parasite does the best on. So when I say the best, it means it lives the longest. It doesn't have to oh, fight as much. It produces the most eggs. It's more fecund, if you will. It just can feed more effectively. So it doesn't have a lot of the downsides of uh, dealing with this host. Now, these ectoparasites then, they aren't necessarily tied indelibly to the their preferred host. They can go on other ones, but we know they're non-preferred hosts or they're off hosts because they just don't do as well. They don't produce as many eggs. They don't live as long. They uh, don't mate as well. And so they're in these non-preferred hosts. So that's what I mean by that. And we see this a lot in these different ectoparasites. But anyhow, we've got these uh, anaplura uh, that will feed on blood and their preferred hosts, you can tell based on their diameter of their claws. The malophaga, on the other hand, are chewing lice. They have these large mandibles because they tend to chew on fur or feathers or maybe skin. Some of them do chew on blood if they, or feed on blood, if they uh, scrape the skin and allow that blood to well up. So there's some differences there. You'll notice their claws aren't nearly as specific because they don't need to hang out in one place and feed. Instead, they're going to wander all over an animal or a human's body, just feeding on fur, feathers, whatever else. Sometimes you'll find them in the environment, feeding on dead skin cells, whatever. So they're a little bit different, but uh, you can tell the difference because their heads tend to be much larger than their thoracic region. So we got Malophaga and Anaplura. Now, Louse-borne disease is very common, especially in certain um, situations like wartime, where soldiers are forced to live in crowded and unsanitary conditions, or for or after natural disasters where people can't get clean. They're in uh, you have a bunch of refugees that are in refugee camps, things like that. So, less responsible for some pretty basic. Uh, disease spreading, things like trench fever, that sort of thing that you, that you read about. It's because of this. When the lice lay their eggs, they tend to lay their eggs on host and they will glue their eggs to individual hairs or fur or feathers or maybe strands of clothing, depending on the species. And these eggs are called nits. Now, probably one of the most common ways of uh, that you've seen lice is the head louse. So that's what's going on here. Anybody who has, you know, been a kid or had kids or known kids or whatever, you've probably known somebody with head lice or had head lice yourself because lice are very good at um, doing what they do. They are very good at getting to new places. So here is just a really crazy louse infestation, this poor little girl. So here she is. Mom is trying to get rid of the lice. They have to use these special uh, combs. And what they're doing is they're cleaning out these anaplura. Look at that. Ah! So you can see they got little tiny heads, 
uh, larger thoraxes, so they are uh, anaplura. These are blood feeding lice hanging out on the hairs. So you're trying to remove the adults, and then you have to remove all the eggs. That's why you use a, another special comb to remove all the eggs that are attached to the head. Poor girl. All right, on to the next order, the Physenoptera. These are the thrips. So remember back to some of our very first orders, I talked about the Physenura. Those were fringed tails. The thrips are fringed wings. So Physen means fringed, Terra means wings. So these are very, very tiny organisms. They are under three millimeters long, and most of them feed on plant tissues. But look at those wings. So they're phytophagous insects, but look at those wings. So those wings are mostly just sticks with fringe hanging off of it. But that doesn't look like it can actually lift anything, right? Well, it works because of that whole idea of the surface to volume ratio. These wings don't need to be large like butterfly wings or beetle wings or anything like that. Because the thrips are so small, they have a different relationship with air. Air molecules actually are very thick to them. They're so tiny, air is about the thickness of water. So they don't need really large wings in order to fly. Instead, they more swim through the water. So they've evolved these oar-like wings with fringe hanging off of them, which allow them to move. But they are at the mercy of wind currents and things. They can't fight against it. So they just sort of move on the wind currents and end up on new plants. So, so phytophagous insects, feed on plants. Now, they are responsible for spreading plant disease. We do know a lot about them, um, but really they're not important for the purposes of this class necessarily. You will see them outside. You'll see them moving around on different things. And if you uh, talk to them or talk about them using their common name, thrips is both singular and plural. So this is a thrips and we have seen many thrips. Neat. All right. Now, the last order we're going to look about look at in this um, lesson are the hemiptera. <clears throat> the hemiptera. Hemi means half, terra means wings. So these have these half and half wings. The four wings are usually very leathery or, or sclerotized in some way, while the hind wings are membranous. Now, the hemiptera are commonly known as the true bugs. So when... Uh, Entomologists talk about true bugs or bugs. We're talking about hemiptera. When people who aren't uh, entomologists talk about bugs, it's basically anything with more than four legs. So there's your major difference. So true bugs are the hemiptera. Now, the hemiptera is a crazy group. We can have all manner of different insects in this group. We can have phytophagous insects, plant feeders. We can have... Uh, predators, we can have ectoparasites, there are some species that feed on blood, they can spread disease. Really, when you start looking into the hemiptera, this is a catch-all order. This is pretty much the order where if you get a new insect that just looks weird, throw it into hemiptera until we can really figure out what is going on. So we will get uh, people just throwing random things into hemiptera and then more and more looking into it and being like, actually, it's this other thing, or maybe it needs a new order or whatever else. So these can include all manner of different insects. We've got everything from, these are some plant feeders right here. So look, it looks a lot like a beetle, but pro tip, uh, beetles, and we'll see this in the next, uh, maybe the next lesson or so, beetles have a line of demarcation down their back. This doesn't have a line, therefore it's hemiptera. So this is a plant feeding insect. This is a blood feeding insect. This is the kissing bugs. It's got these really large um, piercing and sucking mouth parts right there. And this will feed on blood. There's one that looks a lot like this that is much bigger called the wheel bug. It's called the wheel bug because it's got this what looks like a wheel on its prothoracic region. It feeds on plant fluids. This, uh, a lot of people call toe biters. So these are water bugs, but then they also come out of the water and fly around. So down here in Texas, every spring, people will get these just, these are big, you know, several inches long. Um, insects that are just on their window screens uh, near their near lights and they're freaking out. What the hell are these? These are water bugs that are just now out of the water. Uh, here's another type of water bug. Uh, this is a male that has put eggs on its back and it'll move around 
and get rid of things. Uh, this is a plant hopper, one of the prettier plant hoppers. So these plant hoppers will hop around, they'll feed on the phloem of plants. So will these organisms. This is a tree hopper. Look how crazy that is. Feed on the phloem of plants. These are scale insects. So look how strange these things look. This is called the cottony cushion scale. Uh, so this is uh, the insect body. You can see the little legs there. This is the female scale, different species, but it forms this hard sclerotized cover and it lives underneath and then lays its eggs and dies underneath this thing. So this hemiptera is super, super diverse. It's crazy what... Uh, falls into this order. So if you get into plant insects, you will be learning about Hemeptera. Or if you just go out looking at insects, you're going to see a lot of different Hemeptera. This is where we see the aphids. This is where we see bed bugs. This is where we see all manner of things. What is interesting about this group is these uh, phytophagous insects, these plant feeders are feeding on super sugary plant sap all the time, which means they are going to excrete out super sugary liquid fecal material. We call this excretory product um, honeydew, and it is very, very rich in sugars and amino acids. If you've ever parked your car, say underneath a tree that is full of cicadas, another hemipteran or other plant things. If you've ever parked your car like under trees, you come out, there's like sticky sap all over it. That's honeydew. That's the poop of these plant feeding hemiptera. <laughs> now you know. Now honeydew is used as a food source for a whole bunch of different animals. I mean, think about it. High in sugar, high in amino acids. It's super concentrated. Fantastic food. It's also uh, a medium for fungal growth and a bunch of other things. If you ever taste it, it tastes good. It's honeydew. You know, and you're also eating bug poop. So fun. All right. Now, with that, those are those next three orders. Let me know if you have any questions.